Right, well, I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce our last speaker, who I think probably quite a lot of you know anyway. Kim's a, a committee member for the Society for One Place Studies and was instrumental in launching the Society's 2015 migration project I saw on the website. Well, I, I used to be. Oh, okay. She is a past <laughs> member of the seminar organizing committee, which we have. <laughs> And as if she hasn't got enough to do, she's now taken on as Guild Webmaster. So, so it is. <laughs> the subject of her talk, which is now One Manor, Bratton Manor in Bratton Clavelli, Devon, appears in Doomsday, features in the history of the parish through the 20th century. Kim's East Lake family originated in this parish, which prompted her to have the surviving manor documents translated. So she'll focus on what one namers might discover from the manor records in their places of interest. Over to you, Kim. Thank you. And that took care of my first three charts. So, <laughs> um, forgive me. I have a bit of a scratchy throat. So, bear with me. Um, but I'd like to thank all the speakers today. I've learned a lot, and I really like. Uh, Devon and Plymouth and, and all those sorts of things. So thank you very much. But it is a little daunting to follow a bunch of experts. So just fair warning, I'm not a medievalist. Uh, I'm not an authority on manor records by any means. I'm learning something every day about them. What I am is a one-namer who wanted to find out more about my surname, not Baudicino, Eastlake, uh -huh. Eastlake in medieval times. So that's what I want to share with you today. And I think I was amazed, but I think an awful lot of it resonates with what Scott said about the manor records in Devon. So hopefully I can show you real examples today. Now, Sue, I just go on forever, so just tell me when I have to stop, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, my charts, and I have some control on the website now, <laughs> will end up on the website after the seminar. <laughs> So uh, you don't have to take any notes. Everything's pretty much on here. What are we going to talk about? I'm going to tell you why I'm interested in Bratton Manor, which Sue has already done. Um, I'm going to talk about the people who own the manor, because I just think that stuff's interesting. Then we're going to spend most of our time on the court rolls. But after that, I love analysis, and I'm going to spend some time on, on some other things you might pull out if you look across a roll or you look across all the rolls you have. And I'm going to also mention some of these latter-day lords of the manor who are really interesting characters, <laughs> if I don't run out of time. And then uh, on the last page, I've got some recommended sources, so uh, that would be in the chart pack. And everything's about what I'm trying to do is hopefully to spur your own interest in your own manor records, because I think they're absolutely brilliant. Okay, why and where? This is pretty straightforward. My first mention of my surname is Samuel By S. Lake was a tenant in Plymouth in 1333. And Thomas S. Lake had his oats trampled in Bratton in 1377. Now, <laughs> these East Lakes kind of uh, spread out all over the world, and eventually out came Marion East Lake in Arkansas in the States in 1910, and that's my grandmother. So that's why I'm interested in Eastlake. I won't tell you more about Eastlake. You can read it in June's. And there's an unabridged version of that, uh, that one if you want to see more about the spread of the Eastlake name. But, uh, but that's why I'm interesting, interested. One thing I want to point out, let me get used to this. Okay, up here, this is what the trick is with my own branch of the family. They were in Bratton Clavelli, to the best of my knowledge, till the mid-1500s. At that point, one family marched across the river Tamar, and I'll show you where this is located in a minute, and went down to Bodmin, Cornwall, about 30 miles away. They had another, they had a son, and he ended up in Bermuda in, in about 1620s, about 10 years after that island was settled. That guy had a son named Francis, who became a Quaker. And in the la later 1600s, a governor came into Bermuda who really wasn't keen on Quakers. He hops over to New Jersey and starts the East Lack family. And it's the East Lack family instead of the East Lake family because once they got to Cornwall, all bets were off on how this name was spelled. <laughs> so, so I had the problem of uh, my family leaving this area in the mid-1500s, and I wanted to find out more 
about the origins of this name. The other thing I'll mention is I'm really quite lucky um, in that my, the origin of my name was already known. And uh, not for our other name we study, Mark's family, we're still looking for the origin of the Estel surname, but, uh, but this one was already out there. And, and it's, you know when you go to the record office and they put these great big oversized books on the bottom shelf? If you know me, you can guarantee I trip over them. And I tripped over this pole wheel one, and I happened to just pull it out and open it up, and there was a map from 1797, and it actually showed Eastlake sitting up there, right between Bratton Clavelli and Broadwood Widger. And sure enough, there was actually a property sale not long after that, and it wasn't my Eastlake farm, but it was close, and we dashed over there, and there is Eastlake Farm today in Bratton Clavelli, sitting in the same place as you see on this map over here. So um, the, the continuity in this place is pretty strong. Now where does it sit? It's right here in Devon and it's right above, uh, just to the northwest of Dartmoor, about roughly equidistant from Plymouth and uh, from the Bristol Channel. And it also, right about here, is this River Tamar that divides uh, Devon and Cornwall. So. So my guys either moved within Devon or they were just over the border in Cornwall. The other map I found, and this is funny, any of you who have dealt with the Victoria County history of Devon knows that volume one of five was published in 1906. Now I've never seen the other four volumes yet <laughs> and I'm hoping in my lifetime, but there's a doomsday chapter in uh, the Victoria County history. I don't know where they got this map from, but there's Bratona, which is Bratton. There's Boslia, which is Bosley. And there's Godascota, which uh, became Godascote, or later Guscott. And those manors, along with another one named Coombe, which I haven't quite found yet, but uh, which sat about here and kind of may have run up this way. Uh, made up what was the parish of Bratton Clavelli all through all the documents I have until 1885 when this western part became part of Broadwood Widger. But this is Bratton, uh, this is Godescote, uh, Eastlake Farm sits about there, and Coombe picks up a piece here and I should say may, may have run up through German Sweet, and then Bosley's right over here, and they all came together before manor rolls even started, or before I have any manor rolls here. So what uh, Louise and Scott said about, you know, manors and parishes and everything, it's all pretty crazy. But in my case, it had all consolidated so early that I was looking for Bratton Manor. I'd also mention, go find maps. Go find any maps. If you're going to look at manor records, you just got to look for maps, old, oldest you can find and um, ones that show property names, because you're going to be amazed what you see in both the place names and surnames in the manor records for your place. And I'm assuming most of the places were rural at that point in time. But um, you're not going to believe this when I show you how, how many of those places survive today. Okay, let's talk for a few minutes about manorial descent. Uh, why do you do you really care? Well, I think so. I think there's really interesting names in here, and I think also, uh, if you're interested in the early history of your surnames, you're going to be interested in the community as well as, you know, finding your reference. And there aren't that many re references to Eastlake, I must say. You know, I I just wanted to find out about the whole place. And in fact, this went on and branched into a, uh, a one-place study where I'm interested in everything about Bratton Clavelli. And so I'm not on the committee anymore, but I'm still very involved with the Society for One-Place Studies and, and love my one-place study. So I just want to find out everything about the place. Okay, what are you going to find? Brick Trick, Brick Trick was there in Anglo-Saxon times, and Baldwin the Sheriff uh, uh, was named as having... Uh, Bratton Manor at the time of Doomsday, and he had a lot of land in, uh, in, that, in that part of the world. And most of the guys down this side, and I tell you, the Courtney's fit in here somewhere, but uh, we can't quite, quite get them quite placed, uh, but most of the guys down this side were kind of big, big names in land holding, and I'm 
pretty sure they didn't live in Branco Valley. You know, they had a lot of choices. Uh, what I would say, I should mention, this Kim Taylor Moore, I was really lucky this summer, and I got this note from Kim, and she says, hey, I'm working with, you know, the Devon Record Office, or the Devon Heritage Center, on, uh, on Memorial Documents Register Project, and I volunteered to do Memorial Descent, and she said, I see a lot of rubbish out there on the internet about Bratton, and then she quickly adds, but nothing on your website, you know, I <laughs> said, um, and she said, would you be willing to review what I've put together for it, and um, I tell you, she's a medievalist, and in about two or three days, she knew more about this descent than I'd figured out in two years, so, uh, so it was just brilliant, and I was able to contribute a few little tiny things along the way. Uh, the other uh, person I should mention here is a Reverend Whale, and check out your local history publications, because he wrote an article in 1895 that appeared in the Transactions of the Devonshire Association, and it was called manners of Bratton and it was just wonderful now Kim improved upon that and she also had knowledge of what was happening in other manners but uh, but anyway these are neat folks uh, going down this side were the uh, kind of the big 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 landowners and really interesting names I think I talked to uh, one of these mallet folks uh, nowadays and he says they can trace their lineage back to someone who actually fought with William the Conqueror so these are very interesting people the Demariots, I think, uh, oh, what was that, about the time, I hope it was around Edward III or so, I don't know. But anyway, he, Edward was, uh, was arranging marriages between these Demariots and these Langfords over here. I don't know why. And, um, and it, then it, they come around, and Thomas de Somerton had the manor, and they get up to about here, and all of a sudden, some of the big farmers in the local area start buying the manor properties and it starts to look quite a lot more like just big farmers, you know. And that's where I think, you know, some of these manor concepts were start, starting to disintegrate. And, and after about this time, all these guys were local. But by the mid-1500s, this uh, manor, the manor properties were really dividing up. And it's really hard to keep track. And, and, um, and it pretty well disintegrated having something you could call the manor or the manor jurisdiction. But the other thing you might find if you spend some time on these descents is some little surprises. So remember this Thomas de Somerton over here, okay? He goes to the heels in Francie's. Oh, I should mention too, Claville, guess where Bratton Clavelli comes from? And it was called Bratton Francis once too. But look what I found. So Thomas de Somerton, actually, the lands passed to Alice Francis, who got Bratton Manor, but Richard S. Lake got uh, go to scout. So you never know what you're going to... I only found this quite recently, and it was in the feudal aids. Um, I'm not real good at Latin. I can see that there's Richard there. Um, but, uh, but then in another article, just read anything you can on the medieval times if you're trying to understand these. I just look for any article on my area um, in a local history publication on medieval times, and you'll be amazed at what you can find. So that was very exciting, and you don't know what, uh, where your surname's going to quite uh, pop up. I'd also mention that when this went to Alice, uh, John, and Richard, you never see Coombe Coom or Combe and Godescote uh, mentioned as a manor again. I think they just became freeholdings and then just passed on like other property. So it does change over time. Okay, the court roll. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah, I see it coom a lot, and um, and in fact, even well up into the 17th and 18th century, um, I've got a lot of references to Coombe Park, which is actually the the property next to East Lake uh, that I think this was. But there's also North Coombe and Brock's Coombe, and I actually see Coombe later. Um, although it is Comer here, but I never quite know here how much of this has been kind of <coughs> translated either. You never quite know how it's been copied. Go to Scott, uh changed to Gus Scott, you know, so they were changing over time. So, but to me, the earlier version is, is Coombe. Uh, I won't swear to that, and others may have other opinion. Huh? Yeah. 
What's that? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a topological name, but um, but uh, the ones I see earlier tend to be coom. Oh, okay. I, and a couple of my properties have Celtic names, by the way. So this stuff's been around a while. But um, but anyway, yeah. And and I don't know how long these these places were all there before the manor rolls. I have no idea. I you know Anglo-Saxon. I don't know when these things started. Okay. Let's talk about the court rolls. For the past two years, uh, I wanted to find out more about medieval times. Um, wasn't in the uh, memorial documents register. Uh, well, it was. I didn't know it was in little cards on the side till today, to be honest with you. I just look at stuff online. And uh, it wasn't uh, what I did find in the... And this was two years ago, and I thought, what am I going to do with these? And um, we have spent the past two years getting them translated. So that's what this is mainly. And I want to show you the kind of stuff. And, and I know you guys are going to spend all your time looking at names, and we'll come back to them. But I'm going to try and tell you a few more things about what you might find in these roles. Um, so we've spent two years, and in fact, the last two roles uh, we just finished up this month. So, so some of this I've only had a preliminary look at, but I'm quite excited. When I signed up for this seminar, I thought, oh, this would be easy. They'll be all done, you know. But, but my budget kind of had to keep pace, and, um, and that's where we are. So what are, what, what are they? There they are. There is the medieval history of Bratton Clovelly. <laughs> um, so it's funny, you know, the academics, you know, we go up to Yorkshire with Jackie's Jackie's, and we see the Wakefield rolls, and they go on for centuries. Our uh, Louisa says this morning, oh, look at Stepney, you know, 88 volumes. Well, that's, that's Bratton Clavelli, you know, and as one-namers, we don't have a lot of choice. You know, the place picks us. We don't place, pick the place, and that's what survived. But in that stack, there's uh, over 60 court sessions in it, and it's over four centuries, it's not, not much, but you're going to be amazed at the information in these. And the other nice thing about this is I also get a run of several roles uh, fairly close to each other. So if I want to look more closely at what's happening decade to decade, I even have some roles to do that. So, so you don't know what you're going to get. I just say my goal is to get all the information I possibly can out of the ones that I do have because it's a lot more information than I ever had before. I'd also mention that the fellow who translated all these for us, huh, you know Brooke? Oh, good. He's just been, yeah. And, and I'm still, now I've just sent him, he thinks he got all done with the rolls, and I've just sent him ten deeds <laughs> from the 1500s, and some of them were in English. I sent, there was one roll, one short roll, the ninth roll, that was, I knew it was in English. I could almost tell it was in English. And, um, and I said, Brooke, look, you know, how about a transcription? And he made me feel better because when he wrote back, he said, well, it's funny English, you know, and it's got some Latin thrown in, you know, because I thought, but, but anyway, so the deeds, I didn't even care. I said, Brooke, they're a mixture of English and Latin. Whatever you can do with them, I'll appreciate it, you know. So, so that's what we've been up to. And what do they look like? Okay, there you go. So there's the earliest ones in 1377. <laughs> And uh, here's a much later one. Um, as Scott said, you look at these things. Now, it's not easy on parchment, and Devon Heritage Center digitized all these for me and did a brilliant job. Um, but uh, you can pick out names. That's Robert Blake Grove and Bly. She's a bit feisty. We see her quite a bit in the roles. Um, <laughs> but you can pick out other names, even in the other. There's a pain. And there's a, a Colin up there. So once you start looking at these, if you're only interested in names, uh, you can probably do a pretty good job. And obviously with the later one, uh, I mean, you can read these. You know, there's John Chasty and William Chasty and Edmund Pengelly. These are the names, and there's names. The, the earlier roles have a lot more kind of, are a bit more descriptive. The later roles just have tons of names and other information. So, um, so you can uh, do on your own. What else are you going to do to get at them? Okay, I got a translator, okay, and that, that, that's when I was working, okay, so that might be a little different now. Uh, if I'd have waited just a little bit longer, though, I'm really excited. Maybe you'll have something like my youngest son just a week or two ago said, Mom, I think I'm going to study classics at university. 
and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. So <laughs> hopefully you'll get there, and in a few years we'll have a translator in our own family. Um, what else can you do? I mean, some of you I know, Dominic and others, can, can actually, you know, read this stuff. I don't know, maybe like novels. I don't know, but... But, uh, but this is really not quite classical Latin. It's very highly abbreviated. I've seen the transcripts and everything. And, I, uh, and, and between that, the handwriting and the parchment, I thought the better part of valor. I like languages, but I think I was never going to get to the roles. So you, you, may have, you may be able to read it. You may have friends who have it. Do your Google searches. Find if there's translations of parts. I found one of the uh, roles uh, actually... Uh, that Reverend Whale in 1895 had done one of the roles. Um, so you may find things like that. But uh, there's other possibilities too. If you work with a group, um, maybe there's uh, some contributions that can be made or, uh, or maybe you can get a grant. And I was just looking at the Heritage grants and they're a little bigger, but if you combine it with say, if you've got a, some creative folks in your, in your group, your family or local history group, you might... Um, say, hey, let's turn this into a community learning uh, project, and you might well be able to compete uh, uh, for grants. So I guess my feeling is, and I think that that's been reiterated by the other speakers today, is if you want to look at these things and access things, there's ways to do it, okay? And don't just sit there, you know, totally stop just because you've decided learning, you know, Medieval Latin is not, not quite my bag, okay? Uh, there are ways to do it, and there's ways to do it that you're not going to be completely out of pocket, okay? And I would recommend, don't just stick with the names. Go find out what's in these roles, because there's a lot more than just names in it. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to step through different types of stuff that I found in the world. Scott mentioned a lot of this stuff, and a lot of what I found resonates with what he said he was finding in the Devon roles. Sometimes I forget to breathe when I'm speaking. Um, but I'm just going to give you some examples. And I know you all will be reading the names, but I'll just talk along as you're, as you're looking at your names. I should have called these manorial worlds. I got that wrong to start with. Okay, they're manorial worlds. At first I had them called post holders, and I thought, that doesn't feel quite... They're manorial worlds. So this, uh, this manor was pretty simple. It had a reeve who kind of, I think, organized everything. It had a tithing man for uh, Bratton, and it had a tithing man for Godescote. Now, Bratton must have had, my guess is 75 to 100 guys tw age 12 and over, um, and Godescote maybe 25 or so. So anybody who talks about tithings being 10 people, that may have been something that preceded, preceded my manners, because we just had a reeve and two tithing men who were, were elected. In all the roles, you're going to see loads of jurors, and we're going to come back. I'm going to take a, a more detailed look at these jurors, but um, loads of names in there. And, uh, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention, you get some interesting things too, like you start to wonder, well, look, this is a little group, and actually see these jurors in every court session, and you get a lot of the same names. Um, do they kind of dominate, you know, what happens? Well, these are fearers here. Let's see where I am. Uh, there, it turns out those are guys who actually set the uh, level that you could be immersed, and I'll probably call it fine. Technically, they're not fines, they're immersements, because I think they're more arbitrary, but they were actually quite standard here from the beginning and stayed kind of the same. And they actually were a check and balance on um, the manor lord, or lady, as well as uh, the um, manor officials. So you'll get tons of names. Uh, showing who's been elected and who's coming in for the various juries. <coughs> Virtually every role you're going to see that. Every court session you'll probably see that kind of stuff. This is the other one. <laughs> Everybody. You know, in all, uh, all layers of whatever social strata there was, uh, was brewing ale. Okay, and you are just going to get a ton of names. And you're going to get fathers and sons and fathers and daughters. And you're going to get tapsters who had the ends and... There's a, for those of you who know Brant and Clovelly, there's a Clovelly Inn today that we know dates back at least to 1700s because it's scrawled in some wood in there. And I'm wondering, I, I bet you that inn's been sitting, or there's been an inn on that site since, you know, uh, 
1377 at least. Um, but what, you, what I found interesting, by about the mid-1400s, I said, hey, every single court session, these guys are getting these immersements, and they're the same amount every time. So you're going to see uh, William Richard Valleys and his daughter Joan, you're just going to see them in every single role. And I said, this doesn't feel like anybody's breaking any rules. And there was a uh, 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 an assize, uh, there was um, an enactment in like the late 1200s on bread and ale or something like that. But this looked really repetitive to me and sure enough in the 1500s you see it referred to as a license and this was uh, what evolved into the licensing, licensing system and that's why you're going to get it consistently even in the earlier times. And it's, I'll show you it's a big money maker for the uh, lords and ladies so I think they quite like it. And the one I really loved, <laughs> this guy got, got his immersement for n refusing to sell ale. So, so they got you coming and going on this stuff. Uh, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think these manor lords were really quite, quite clever. But, uh, but anyway, so that's a great place for names. Personal actions. Now Scott mentioned these. These are great. Okay, they're mainly of three kinds. One, you can break an agreement. Don't see too many of those, but some loads with trespassing and where this is where your animals have gone onto somebody else's land and trampled Thomas's oats or whatever. And you get debt and everybody was borrowing and lending in these days. So you didn't have banks and everybody and his brother was borrowing and lending. You could bring these personal actions and this is where an individual rather than a, a, a manor official uh, brought a case to court. But it was expensive. Uh, it, it turns out these guys would complain and the defendant then in the next session would raise their own countersuit and you and, and, and I call it like theater mini theater or something where they all got settled out of court or never got settled they just went on forever they um, you know they got they had to pay for licenses to agree but every single court session both the guy or who complained and the person being complained about and he might have complained about the husband, wife, and daughter even, we're getting, we're getting immersements. So you're just racking up. And, and so I'm sure that the lords and ladies were delighted, you know, come bring your, your complaints here. But, but I think you had to have a little money to do this. Um, and so I think it tended to be probably uh, the slightly larger, larger farmers. I can't prove that. Lots of interesting things going on in the names there, but as I said, I'll come back to some of that. Um, but uh, let me just point out, you start to see uh, we had one attorney, but he was a local farmer, okay? That's the only attorney I saw in the roles. There was a couple mentions of them. Um, you start to get property names. Now, Rexel, Rexel is still exists today, so I know where uh, that guy was living, okay? And that's why I say, get your maps. Um, you might, you'll also, if, uh, the Lord could kind of have their own complaints, and his steward was kind of looking out for his interests, and, and if you mucked with the Lord, so they were always cutting down the Lord's trees, okay? They liked that. Uh, you got higher, higher immersement. So, so lots in these personal actions. And two professors, Briggs and Schofield, uh, working with the Cambridge group, have recently, fairly recently, done a big project on personal actions. And fascinating, I, I actually wrote them and said, <laughs> And, and they actually sent me some of their papers, some of which are not that easy to uh, get hold of. So if you want to find out more about something, go do your Google searches or whatever, and I'll bet you you'll come up with stuff. And they were really helpful, and they had examples. These really are dramas. Like one, the guy brought a complaint to court, countersuit with probably another complaint. As it turned out, it all harked back to when the, guy, the, the defendant and the guy's wife had been messing around some time before. So these are little dramas where people can air grievances or just make public, do a public shaming or anything. But there were lots of reasons for bringing these personal actions to court. It was not necessarily to just get your money back. Collective responsibility. Look for this. This tells you more about your community. Oh, and through this, you might sense the Lord really doesn't feature here. This community was running itself. You know, I, I know Scott said that the lords might kind of, you know, go up the scale and move away. I don't think mine were ever there, you know. And um, I got one mention of the steward's name in all the roles, and that was just to claim some of expenses. So she, she or he did have someone there, but this community was just taking care of itself. I'm sure of that. 
collective responsibility. The community understood what it was responsible for as a group, and there was such a thing as corporal punishment or group punishment. So in those days, I think if 12 men, you know, said, yep, something happened, well, it did happen. That just was fact. And you'll get a lot of information on highways. I love this because Brighton Clavelli has this really difficult road system that kind of goes like this. Okay, and that's about it. And it's still the same today, and you can see the names of places on that road from these, and, and I can see that it was the same roads uh, way back uh, in the uh, medieval times. Um, another one is uh, the, the jurors said, okay, uh, hey, somebody's overcharged. In fact, the Reeve overcharged, so they're watching out for each other, and they're watching out for the officials as well. And this one we're going to come back to. Here, the whole tithing got, got immersed because they didn't track down what were all the goods of Richard Watt, this felon. And I'm going to come back to him shortly. This is just sheer human interest. And I know you'll love this if you find this on, on people with your name. But this was a rowdy bunch. And I remember and we got to about the mid-1400s and my translator wrote me and said, hey, it looks like they quit, you know, beating each other up and started using the court a little bit more. Uh, this, was, this could be quite raucous. And what, it was really good again for the lords and ladies because if you had a fist fight, every time you threw your fist, you were going to get another immersement, you know. And, uh, but there were some other interesting things about it too. Had to find the weapon, and I think we see some of that today. Okay, had to find the weapon, and the whole tithing was responsible for that. Um, this one... The tithing didn't bother to mention that there had been a fist fight and the whole tithing got in trouble. So that was a year prior. And, uh, and the other one I found interesting is uh, now the pillory and stocks are in decay. And you could see that things were settling down. And there's a set of stocks in the St. Mary's Church in Bratton Clavelli. And I'm going to go back and see just how old those stocks are. I wonder if it's, these are the ones they're talking about. So you'll love this stuff. And there are some. It's not a huge amount, but there's some really interesting and vivid uh, accounts of um, the assaults. And they could involve men or women, or both. Property is where you're going to get huge amounts of information. Uh, this top one, I think the lady of the manor came out with something like 26 cockerels from this little new tenants coming in anytime you got a property change but you can see lots more stuff besides all the names um, you know you've got the places and I again I can place most of these uh, military service someone died here's one who lists a, a minor okay you don't see them that often in the roles uh, and he's an heir of this guy and this one is really interesting. This guy just would not come back. And I never did see him come and, and give homage and fealty to the lady. And this, this court was really quite relaxed. You could have these things go on forever. And as long as they got their little immersement every time, you know, these things might never finish. So I don't think Robert ever came back and made, I've never seen it. But 50 years later, there's a Robert Kirkham becoming the Lord of the Manor. And which is probably his grandson. So I think there was a freeholder who decided he didn't really owe, uh, owe allegiance to this lady. And by the way, I should mention, the freeholders, all of Godescope was freeholders. Okay, I'm sure of that. And there were other freeholders. They all came to court. Okay, the freeholders, the copyholders, everybody was in court. You might get things like this. And I think um, Scott mentioned a bit of this. Uh, I got... This 1408 role was fantastic, and you can start to detect a bit of socioeconomic uh, structure. So Walter looks like he had multiple properties. Here's Joan. She had two cottages, and by the way, those were in her name. Um, and, uh, and then this John Bate, he looks like he, he was a pretty big, big wheel there. So that's interesting stuff. In the later roles, although the descriptions of assault are become much more boring, these descriptions of property are brilliant. So I love all my knights. And in fact, this Shilston Calmody, he got Eastlake Farm. And uh, in addition, for those of you who work with this part of Devon, the Calmody papers are, are a huge uh, collection that's deposited with De Devon Heritage Center. So uh, these look like quite, quite an elite little group up here. And this Weiss, Wise, he shows up and they go on for centuries of nights uh, in that family. But you also get who's the free tenants. You get occupations. In the case of free tenants, they have an heir. 
And then you get this funny mention of conventionary tenants, and this really surprised me. Now, and I did another Google search, found some nice papers. This was a, 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 a tenancy a, a arrangement in, in all over Cornwall, and it spread into parts of Devon, and I suspect it came into my area earlier, because what I am missing in entirety is people doing works for the Lord. They weren't. They were paying these immersements, they were paying their, their rents, and, uh, and getting on with it. Conventionary tenants originally started out, I think, as real leaseholders back in medieval times uh, who would get seven-year leases, but by custom, they tended to go stay with the same family, uh, you know, term after term. And I wonder if uh, I had quite a number of Cornish uh, lords and ladies of the manor, if my, my people were mostly conventionary tenants rather than copyholder in the sense we've been hearing about today. So that was really interesting. But you do see, although his son, I'm sure that's his son, took it. It might be his brother. Uh, but it doesn't say he's the heir, okay? So that's not, he not, doesn't have a right to it, uh, but by custom he's getting it. And, and in addition, these conventionary uh, tenants could come and go. Um, the freeholders could come and go. People came and go, went a lot from this parish. So, so you get a lot more information in the later roles, and you also start to get just brilliant connections between people and places. And I think all but about one of these uh, farms mentioned on here is still there today, so I know where these people lived. Okay, So it's just, just huge, as well as some of the stuff on you know, honorable military order, the bath, and exciting things like that. Just to mention as last examples of these, I'm not too far off time, uh, you get some odd things, okay? So felons really weren't tried in the manor courts, but you get them mentioned, and, and I remember that Richard Watt I mentioned. So they've got a whole inventory. They came back, the tithing got, got its immersement, and they came back with the inventory, so that's interesting stuff. Another fellow later on told me why it was important to the manor court. It's because these fugitive felons, all their goods went to the lord or lady of the manor. And so they were quite interested in knowing what all they owned. This other one, it's the only morality one in here. It should be in the church court. I don't know how, he, how it got there. But I'm really disappointed that they left it. The clerk seems to have left it at, etc. I'd really, really like to know what that says. And for all you people who have some interest in surnames, recognize that one? There's a Yo Farm in uh, Bratton that was there before the first manor roll and that is South Yo and you see it spelled South Yo as well so there's some very interesting things going on with names in these roles that I think you'll love. Okay so that's the types of things that I think you'll see in the roles and I think it's a lot like the types of things Scott talked about but my favorite part of the uh, seven pillars is the analysis phase so I said okay I've only got 10 roles, you know. I want to do as much as I can with it. And I've only just gotten a start. I'll probably be entertaining myself for years with these roles. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so I just want to give you some examples of the things you might draw out from looking at the, the roles in, in more of an aggregate type thing. So what are some, thing, some things you're going to do? I think you probably want to see what the court is spending its time on. And now you can see, yeah, look at that brewing, you know. <laughs> they love that. And it may not seem like a lot of, lot of money, but gosh, this was 1377, you know. And these courts, they were taking place at least quarterly. I think later on they were even taking place mon monthly. And I should have mentioned, too, in Bratton, there's only courts, okay. There's not courtly, court baron. There's just courts, okay. The, in, in the 1600s, they say it's a court baron, but they say it's a frank pledge view in court baron, which I think means court. Okay, so, uh, so we don't have any of the, uh, we got everything being covered here. These personal actions rack up some good, uh, good income, okay, so nobody's complaining about that, and that's where they kind of just play out all the tensions of the community. But in addition, all these other sorts of things going on, a lot of them are being brought by court officials. You don't have to be somebody raising a complaint. So they've clearly got responsibilities across the whole community, and there's things in the, in the custom of the manor that's watching out for the community as a whole. Another thing I'm sure you'll look at is how many people did I find. And now this is a, a, a parish of probably 
350, 400 people. You can't, you got to be very careful about using pop, getting population off of these numbers, but I have other reason to believe that. And uh, it, I, that little red line just means how many court sessions, and I, all I'm trying to show is you may only have four court sessions, but you may get as many names as if you had 10 court sessions, okay? It's not really related to that. I think here in these through the 1400s, that's probably not too far off the number of household heads, okay? Whereas there's some reasons why in 1408 and in 1684, uh, that you're probably getting a census of either all the males, age, uh, almost a census of all the males age 12 and up, or possibly all adult males, but uh, you're, you're probably getting most of the males except for, for the youngsters uh, in those roles. The reason is there's a list in 1408 in one of the very few places where it refers to the unfree. We don't really have unfree in Branton Clavelli, it seems, you know, they're just free tenants or some other kind of tenants, which I think are conventionary. Uh, but the unfree was a list of all these names of all these people being pledged in. And inevitably, almost inevitably, the name who was pledging them in would have the same surname as the person being pledged. So I think these are the youngsters who uh, didn't have their households yet. That's my suspicion. And in addition, that list showed and said this one withdrew from the manor, this one withdrew. So it looks like they could come and go at will as long as they didn't have a house. And if they had a house, they could come and go still as long as they paid up in the court. So, so you get some uh, huge name coverage. And the most important thing is before I had these, where am I, roles, before 1500s, I only had 14 names in my, in my manor. And now, you know, in 13... 77 alone, I've got, what, 70 names? I mean, there's just no comparison to the kind of information you can get out of these records. And even later, when I have more records, they're not necessarily the same names, and I'll show you just a tiny bit, you start to connect these sources together, and you can find out just so much more about your community. Another thing I think you're going to do, this was just pretty automatic, is you're going to look at everything you can find out about individuals in the roles, okay? And you can find out an awful lot. Now, occupation, Broodale isn't really, but it gave me a nice place to, to record it, and I'm going to change my post to manorial role. That's my new term for today. Um, but you can find some relationships. You can find information on property. Here's one of those withdrew out of the lordship. You can find aliases, and we'll look at that some more. Huge amount of information when you start to look at everything it's saying about any given individual. And when you put that together with some of the other sources you have, you really start to get a much more complete uh, picture. What else might one namers want to do with their roles? I think they might want to look at surnames, huh? So, uh, so I took the lazy way out on surname frequency and I just used a wordle. <laughs> um, but you can sit there and count them all, obviously. Um, I would mention Wordle.net is kind of the big name in Wordles. It doesn't seem to work on Chrome and Firefox right now, but there's a worded out that's not as fancy, but um, you can get this information. So easy way to see your prevalent names. You might want to look at name groupings. I mean, I get all kinds of ideas on variant names or, or even deviant names. Now, so something like, you know, uh, reds, I know some of these groups are, I'm absolutely certain they're the same, same family or, you know, same surname. Not so sure on Borton, Boton, and Boveden, that might be two or three families, but you can get a lot of ideas. The other one I, I highlighted here is Miller. Now, they're obviously not the same name. Melatone is Milltown, and uh, that's actually where the court was held. So I never got really a found a manor house, but I did. I had to wait till the 1600s because they always said the court was held in the same place, but they never told me what place. But then I finally found, found Milltown. So it's just that you can tell how important the mill was uh, to, the, to the manor um, by the number of names that came out of, uh, out of uh, Miller. And um, Andrew, hold that thought on the Bodens down here. I'm going to come to them. So what's another thing uh, you can look at? Surname persistence, okay? So, this is a little complicated, but in 1408 to 38, those roles had 125 unique surnames. 74% I had not seen 
in the 1300 rolls. Now, admittedly, those rolls were kind of small, but even up here, uh, only 16% in the big rolls in the 1600s uh, were still appearing that appeared in the 1400s, and these are just surnames. So basically, my view is this, this community was on the move. Okay, they were moving a lot in medieval times, and I could tell from the unfree tenants who were withdrawing, but I can tell from the surnames. And today, of all things, I love coming to these seminars because I meet such interesting people. But, um, and I met um, Timothy Blatchford, who he says his, where's Timothy? Yeah, yeah there's Timothy. Uh, the Blatchfords, I think their first occurrence of their name may be, have been in this, uh, in this area. And then Andrew, where's Andrew? So Andrew comes up and he says, oh, look at my name. And his name's Voden. Now, I didn't know that before today, but Voden, I have highlighted because down here I picked all the ones who I could see through at least three centuries, and Voden is the only one that was there in all of the centuries. And in fact, Voden persisted into the 20th century in Bratton Clavelli, and it's a, I think it gets the prize hands down, okay? So, uh, so congratulations, Andrew, and we've got some work to do together. We've already just, and he happens to live in Taunton too, so it's just my lucky day. <laughs> So, uh, okay, now, surnames weren't persistent, but boy, property was. Okay, these aren't fancy. I'm not so great with the paint programs, but, uh, but everything in pink is kind of the old manor. Here's Bosley. Bratton actually was all this, but I just highlighted Bratton Town. Here's Coombe, and the rest of this is go to the, the blue stuff, or purpley stuff, is... Um, is stuff that appeared in, was there before 1377, the first roll. Okay, you know, awful lot of this, these farms, actual, these farm names, you know, or something that you could tell was this farm name, uh, were there before the manor rolls even started. And I don't know how long. And some of these others you didn't see till later rolls. Uh, they may have come later, or maybe they just weren't mentioned in the earlier roll. But you can see that the vast majority of, uh, of, of this parish was defined um, in, in medieval times. And the only ones that were really missing were all these Barton farms right down around, around where I think the manor was because the mill was right about here. And also this, these borough farms, which I think were the church. And so I think you're going to get a lot. Now, they may be mentioned as place names or I also saw them as surnames. Okay, I've picked up both. Okay, um, so you're either going to get that the place you can clearly see or you're going to get, hey, there was somebody living in the parish who had, you know, that that name came from. So, so uh, I thought that was really quite exciting. And again, can't emphasize enough the importance of maps. You might want to look at a particular group. So there weren't that many women in these roles, but they were there. And uh, they were 7% of the roles. And when you have hundreds and hundreds of names, there, were, there was more than a few mentions. They were an active bunch, okay. They could be involved in anything, m lending money, um, owing money, brewing ale. They definitely brewed ale. And in fact, one held the manor, oh, I got manor roll right there. Manor roll of uh, ale test taster. Uh, but they could also, they could be hired for wages, and I had them complaining when they, when they didn't get paid their wages. Uh, they could um, own, uh, have properties in their own name and go swear homage and fealty uh, to the Lord or Lady. So the women were an integral part of this community, and if any of you have more roles, I think it's really interesting to take a particular group and see what all can I find that these roles are telling me about that group of people. Now, Bratton Clavelli wasn't too stratified, so I don't have too many groups. But, uh, but another one I looked at is these uh, oh, manorial worlds. So I went back to these jurors because I only had, you know, two tithing men and a reeve. So I could only look at the jurors was the only really other defined group. And I said, hey, are these guys kind of an elite group? Well, I looked, and first of all, they were 20% of the names in the roles, which is a pretty high percent, actually. Uh, but in addition, I found they were 20% of the surnames, which says... There weren't dyna dynastic families in this, uh, in this manner, and there never were even to this day and in the 19th century, huge surname diversity in this uh, manner, and I guess so with everybody moving. Uh, but I did see, you know, a lot of the names would persist from jury panel to jury panel and did another little word on that. So you might want to take a look, but I said, how am I going to get out if this was an elite group? Was this group really different from the community as a whole? So the next thing I did, I said, okay, let me take, I took one of the roles, and I said, what were they doing in court? Okay, well, over here you can see 
of the total people who came to court, uh, most of them were defendants. There were complainants and brewers and the like. But, uh, but if you look at just the jurors, they were the ones raising these personal actions. So all of a sudden, it's, I think really they had a little bit more money or maybe a little bit more property than the rest of the gang. Maybe not a lot, but they had a disproportionate amount of the personal actions and they acted as surety uh, for people who had to appear in court uh, more often. So, so I thought, yeah, that feels like a bit of an elite group. And then I said, what else can I do to get at it? And, it, and I said, um, oh, let me look at some of my other sources, okay? And I just did this with one in the later roles, and I said, let me compare the 1674 hearth tax with the 1684 court roll. And it was pretty easy matching, um, but uh, I didn't get too many matches, and there's reasons for that I won't go into, but what I did get was the total community in the, in the hearth tax, that's the distribution of how many had one hearth, two or more. And, and this, was, this place was not a fancy place, okay? Most of these were farms and they're pretty functional. But you can tell by the green, the jurors on average had more hearths uh, than the rest of the gang. So maybe that's not a good indicator of socioeconomic status, but maybe that highlights, just use your imagination on how you might combine these sources uh, to figure out the questions you're trying to answer. Okay. Let me just spend a few minutes on um, the Johnny-come-latelys, okay? And these are guys uh, that came uh, after medieval times. And basically after that time where I showed you in the later 1600s that the manor lands had pretty well disintegrated. Now, it got even worse and people died and lines died out and people went into debt. So these manor properties were strewn everywhere and you really had no sense of a manor by probably the late 1600s. But um, in the 1700s, along comes William Wimpy. I swear they had different motives than the earlier lords. The ear earlier lords and ladies were just, they had an economic investment. They sent their steward. They let the community get on with it, and they took all their immersements, you know, it was, and their rents. So, but I think these later ones had a little different motivation. So William decides he wants to be a man or lord. And he gets a bit of money from his dad. So you have the will, and I'll show you some of the sources you can find these later uh, manor lords all over the place. Um, and he, uh, you can actually see that he eventually amassed a thousand acres. You can tell that when that property went to sell after his death. Another one, I know he was seen as the lord of the manor, and it's a funny way. There was a novel written in the 1890s by Sabine Baron Gold, Baron Gould, and I don't know if you've heard of him, but he was a prolific writer, and he wrote Onward Christian Soldiers as well. Um, so he was a great writer, and he based a novel called Red Spider on Bratton Clavelli. And he even went so far as to go back to the parish registers and use some of the old names. But he refers to Squire Impey. And I am sure it's shooting, that's William. So, but anyway, uh, William dies in testate. So he spends 40 years collecting up 1,000 acres, and he dies. So I don't think his motivation was entirely economic. I think he wanted to be Lord of the Manor. But what happens is... And, and you love these things. I love these things. I'm in the middle of a transcript of this abstract of a title of the next guy who had the manor trying to figure out what was happening. And there's a tree, and it says, Ha, ah, this is how William Wimpy land descended to Joseph King way over here. So that was fantastic, because he died just about a year or two after William. And, um, and, it, and it did uh, go to Joseph. So I'm going through this, and I'm on page 38 of typing up this transcript of this court case. And I'm like, it's really interesting, but, you know, it's a lot of properties and everything. And it has all the history of what happened to all these properties, both in terms of purchase and lease from, like, the early 1700s. It's just a brilliant document and very easy to read. And I'm reading it, it says, and by the way, this is Joseph King, he says, if the property I got from William amounts to more than 10,000 pounds, I want to set aside 2,500 pounds for his servant, Joan X. Wartworthy, and our four illegitimate children. <laughs> there's, a, there's a woman, Rita Rain, Rainbird or something, who studies the Shoplin family, and actually a young enterprising Thomas Shoplin at age 23 married Joan X. Worthy shortly thereafter at age 38, um, and, uh, and ended up with a great deal at the top of Bratton Town. But, uh, but anyway, and in addition, this court case was actually brought by Joseph King's kids to say, 
you better be sure what's Joseph's land and what's William's land. And after this court case, I haven't quite, I've, I've gotten three of the four follow-ups that are up at TNA. I haven't gotten the fourth one to really find out what happens. But you can guess because all those Hexworthy children shortly thereafter changed their name to Wimpy. So, uh, so anyway, I think you'll love looking into uh, the Lords and uh, you'll get lots more information on them. Let me show you one from the 19th century. Oh, okay, so he dies. Everything's sold off as a result of this court case, okay, and we move on. We don't have a manor again. Long comes Thomas Ellis Manning, okay, and he comes in, and I finally, after all these centuries, have a manor house, okay. He builds Everfield Manor, and it's one of the grandest properties in West Devon. I mean, you know, for those of you who know that area, that's pretty rural, so he builds this grand, grand place. And he actually, uh, so he wants to be a lord too. Actually, he did leave a probate, but he didn't leave any children. So this one went to another cousin. So I think he and William probably had a lot in common. But he dies in 1882, and his probate says he's got 28,000 pounds, okay? He leaves in personal effects to his wife, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth just becomes the great benefactress of everybody. And she redoes St. Mary's Church and all the, all my old, Burnby and medieval stained glass windows are gone and my roots green. But, uh, but anyway, she does a beautiful job with the church. And, uh, and she's also active in Morwenstow and Hulse. And, and, and in fact, Thomas Ellis Manning, we were looking, I was in touch with the online parish clerk of, of Morwenstow. He says, where is that guy buried? Because I knew Elizabeth was buried at St. Mary's. And we got to looking and it says, Hulse. I was wondering where that is, you know, and, uh, and it took us a while to find that. And, and then I'm looking, it says near Taunton. And I'm like, wait a minute, I live in Taunton. And it turned out Thomas Ellis Manning is buried three miles from our house in a little village I never knew existed. And there's plaques in that church that actually explain the lineage. But Thomas was just a stationer in Biddeford. And he got a, a thousand pounds from a spinster aunt in Mormonstow and decided to be a lord of the manor. Now, I think there's still something. We can't find out. He, his father's name, though, was John Glanville Manning. And Glanville was a very old name. In fact, there was a Glan, Glanville's tenement or, or, uh, in Bratton Clavelli, right near the mill. So I wonder if there weren't some ancient connections. But so far, we haven't been able to track it down. The other fascinating thing, and you've got to look at these sales brochures, Finally, when they died and this uh, Major Gill got this land, he tried to sell it off whole. It was 1,100 acres again, quite like William. Uh, he couldn't, and he busted it up into 28 lots. And I know from the lady living in the post office now, and her family's been there since the post office opened, she said it was in 1919 that many of the people finally got ownership of their properties, especially in the village and all. So it was at this sell-off. And I would say this is really when the concept of manor... Yeah, it, it, the, Thomas Ellis Manning, even in the bureau, burial register, it says Lord of the Manor. So the concept was still there. Um, and I, and, and I, I understand that they were still curtsying to the lady of the manor. Uh, but I think this is probably when it died. But I'll just mention one more fellow uh, who was a 20th century... So guess, guess who was living at Eversfield when the story about Diana and James Hewitt broke? And you can only imagine what it did to this quiet little rural community of 400 people. But the thing I really love was in 1995, he was a lug slug and a cad, and I think there's even a mention of treason. When they're trying to sell Eversfield for $2.5 million in 2011, he's become the dashing James Hewitt. <laughs> so... So uh, keep an eye on who owns that manor, and to this day, I'm sure that the people in the parish watch who's moving into the big manor house, even if the whole concept is gone. So just in summary, what do I think my manor was like? I think it's a lot of the things that Scott said, okay? For the lords and ladies, the early ones, it was an economic investment, and I think that's pretty much what it was. Uh, for the later ones, the William and Thomas and... And these later ones, I think there was something quite social or something else going on uh, with them that drove them to spend most of their lives accumulating this property only to lose it in entirety. And by the way, Mrs. Manning, you know, I said uh, Thomas left 28,000 pounds. Mrs. Manning left 3,000 pounds. So she'd been a real good benefactress. <laughs> um, 
the domain land, there never was mention of works, okay? They didn't do work. I, I don't believe there was anything, and that's why I wonder if conventionary tenants was more what's going on. Uh, so it may have just been woodlands and pastures, but there were not people showing up who owed services to the Lord. I mean, there were Harriets and payments, but it was all economic. So that was very interesting to me. For the parishioners, it was self-regulating. I mean, you got in, you just do not hear mention unless they've, you know, trespassed on the Lord's land. The Lord doesn't even come into it. They are regulating themselves. And in addition, you had a lot of things where you know, this one was four-handed or two-handed or this one, you know, swore. It's based on trust and familiarity. The customs, though, as I showed you, there's a lot of cases that were brought by the court officials. I think they concern the community as a whole, even if uh, the people bringing personal actions may have been those who were a little better off, uh, some of the bigger farmers. Um, I think it was looking out for the community as a whole. There were freeholders and leaseholders, uh, but... They probably had similar amounts of land and they all went to court and they all did kind of the same thing. So I, I wouldn't call it a totally egalitarian social structure, but I got the feeling that most of what was happening in this community was because of what people knew about each other. And you did get, you'll be lucky if you get one of your guys who said, it says, I had one, I think he was a totally, not to be mixed up with, Toll, who I had too, uh, who said, um, who said uh, he's just a general nuisance and is a real problem in this community. So, so um, but anyway, um, it was by familiarity. And the other thing that I found quite interesting was that people were coming and going all the time. So I had started out with this concept of feudal as stratified, rigid, you know, um, maybe even somewhat oppressive. I think now, if I thought about it, I'd say it was a really, it seemed like a really close-knit knit and inter, interdependent community. And I think there was a really healthy respect for and understanding of the rights and responsibilities of everybody in that community. That's what I've come out with. And the biggest difference, I'd say, from today is you don't have central government in there. You know, uh, so, uh, so I found it very interesting. Um, and I really hope that you will take a look at your own records. I've learned a lot. I've got a lot more, lot more to learn. Put some suggested sources. Um, and in addition, I'm happy to answer questions, but you've got experts in the guild. You saw a lot of people have been looking at manor records. So, And the other thing, and, I, and Scott mentioned this too, don't a underestimate Google search. I mean, I can put in Bratton Manor or Bratton Clavelli Manor, and I'm sorry for those of you who thought it was Bratton Wiltshire. Or, uh, or Bratton Fleming, uh, but uh, but you will find things on Google search uh, that will be helpful. And that's it. Thank Kim, thank you. That was absolutely super. Any questions from anybody? That's what I get for him in the last session, isn't it? <laughs> No? No questions? Obviously not. Well, okay. thank you very much again. It really was most interesting and, and to see how you've gone through it and what you've done with it. And I'm sure it will inspire quite a lot of other people that, um, you know, perhaps have thought about it but haven't actually got round to it to, um, to do anything.